Hello, bonjour, Tavar Zamchana. Merci uh, pour votre participation. Bienvenue à tous. Pour écouter, pour, écouter, pour écouter notre webinar en français, veuillez cliquer en bas de votre écran sur l'onglet Interpretation et sélectionner le drapeau français. Merci. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Curry. I'm a senior officer with uh, ICLEI's Urban Systems Unit. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, the fifth of our webinars as part of African City Food Month. We're very excited to explore the theme today um, of how youth and women-led small businesses can improve local food systems. We uh, are delighted uh, today to be on a journey with um, uh, our FAO colleagues who are going to facilitate uh, for us. Uh, before we begin, uh, I would just like to run through our normal webinar uh, rules uh, or protocols. Uh, the webinar will be recorded. Uh, so please note that by participating, uh, you're consenting to be recorded. Uh, we hope that you will enter your uh, names into the chat where you're from, tell us a little bit about uh, yourselves, and uh, do ask questions as we go through um, the session so that uh, our facilitator uh, can ask these of the uh, panelists. Um, we welcome fervent discussion when it comes time to uh, that period. So. Uh, please do share your thoughts. Um, before I hand over to uh, our colleague facilitator, uh, just to see who's joined us today. Brian, you can go to our next screen. So uh, again, our favorite question of your favorite food. Uh, today we are dominated by pasta and pizza, but also rice and fish, fruit, cheese, uh, ugali and fish, fufu and palm soup, uh, framboise, kale, plantain, aubergine, uh, sumbala, uh, salad. Uh, so a nice mix. And from our cities, um, dominated by Cape Town participants, uh, but also Dakar, Ouagadougou, Johannesburg, Kampala, Bamako, Harare, uh, Abidjan, Paris, Pretoria, Nairobi, uh, Maputo, uh, and Tananarivo. So welcome, everyone. Uh, always a pleasure to have you with us. So as I said, this is part of African City Food Month. Um, we have set uh, these themes and now we are in our last week of uh, the campaign exploring how youth, women, business and innovation uh, support our urban food systems. Um, and again, we uh, ask you to share your insights uh, from this webinar, uh, as well as from your own work using the hashtag African City Food Month. Um, we'd like to say a big thank you to our partners in delivering um, African City Food Month. Uh, it's brought to you by ICLI, FAO, and RUAF, with support from the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, Ricolto, African Center for Cities, WWF, the South African Urban Food and Farming Trust, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So with that said, uh, quite excited for today's discussion, uh, and we'd like to hand over to um, our colleague Barbara Schlutka from the FAO uh, sub-region for Southern Africa um, to introduce and guide us through this discussion. Thanks very much, Barbara. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paul, and welcome to everybody again. So as Paul said, my name is Barbara Hladka and I'm the agribusiness officer in the sub-region of Southern Africa. I work with FAO and I'm based in Johannesburg. It's my real pleasure to also welcome you to this webinar um, where we specifically want to understand how city invest or how they could invest in the food systems that feed their citizens and what role innovative uh, small enterprises and medium enterprises, mainly youth-led, can have in the process. So um, when we were preparing the Africa City Food Month, with ICLI, RUAF, and other partners. The main idea behind was to point out and facilitate discussion around different topics that are relevant for, for cities in Africa mainly. We have started with the main problem of resilience and nutrition, but we also wanted to talk about the opportunities that goes beyond COVID and food security. So one of the major challenges, and I believe you will agree with me, 
Africa faces today is the issue of unemployment, in particular for youth. And with this connected the rural urban migration. So this issue of youth unemployment is hugely um, present in, in African cities. I also have read in one article from FAO that average farmer in rural areas in Africa is 60 plus years old, which is quite impressive uh, considering that large part of food consumed by African people comes from these farmers. So the question really is where our food comes from in 20 years time, for example, considering that African nations also import large amount of food from outside the continent, which goes to more than billion of dollars per year each year. The question is, um, and the question we would like to also respond today is how can we convert the huge potential that urban and peri-urban unemployed youth represent into a more sustainable future. The question is how cities can turn the problem of unemployment into their opportunity um, and what policies and financial mechanisms they will need to put in place to spur the innovation and entrepreneurship in resilience. Um, in, in the resilient, safe and sustainable food systems that feed, that feed their citizens and what support youth and women-led businesses need from cities to reach this goal. So, um, dear participants, uh, let me pause here. Uh, today we will hear from six presenters with very diverse background and experience. So, uh, let's, let's start straight away with the first one. Um, so, with no more hesitation, let me introduce my dear colleague and great inspiration, Dr. Alain Onibon. Alain studied the social science and soft system methodologies at the University in the Netherlands and have a Master of Agriculture Science of the National University of Benin in cooperation with the Wageningen University. Alain, you can put your video for us. Excellent, thank you. Nice, nice to see you. He has more than uh, 30 years of professional experience in the field of ag agriculture and rural development, covering various topics such as natural resource management and agriculture community value chain development, institutional development and capacity building. Interestingly, as the first director general of that and advisor to the president of the Republic of Benin, Ellen Onibon has worked to set up the coordination mechanism of the Beninese administration of both horizontal and vertical levels. And from 2010, Elaine works for FAO Investment Center, where he focuses on advising government and regional economic communities on mainstreaming policies, measures into CADAP and developing agriculture investment plans and agriculture development funds. So join me please to welcome Elaine. Elaine, the floor, floor is yours for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes very okay. well. Uh, I have to share my screen. You don't need to share your screen, Elaine. We'll move the slides for you. Thank you. You you are doing it for me. That's okay. You you have it. So go ahead. Okay. Okay. So uh, good morning to or good afternoon to to everyone. It's. Uh, a great pleasure to join uh, this, uh, this webinar today. Uh, I understand I have uh, 10 minutes of presentation. Uh, so what I, my presentation is focused on, uh, on public policies. Uh, I'm public policy specialist, uh, mostly. So what I would like to present today is how uh, public policies can support uh, building sustainable uh, food systems. When we say uh, food systems, let's visit the concept uh, first. Uh, we mean something that is very complex. Uh, we see a wide range of, of value chain players, uh, farmers, uh, goods and services suppliers, uh, the banks, the, the insurance companies, uh, processors, wholesalers, aggregators, retailers, consumers, etc. All those players are, are developing business relationships and, uh, and they have interlinked activities. 
uh, but the full systems uh, it's it's, it's, it's also based on, on, on agricultural uh, products, uh, products from the forest, from the fisheries. When I say agriculture, I mean uh, also livestock. And uh, uh, the food systems uh, take place in the broader economic, uh, societal, and, uh, and natural environment. Uh, so, and for it to be uh, sustainable, uh, it has to be uh, economically uh, sustainable, meaning uh, in, in the, in the, uh, uh, viable in the long term. Uh, it has to be uh, uh, sustainable uh, socially and economically. Uh, I have economical twice, two times. I have to check it. Uh, sorry for that. One, one of the lessons that we have learned from the COVID pandemic is that more the, the, the food system, the, the, the value chains are, are long and we move uh, uh, food from long remote places, uh, the the, the the disturbance uh, is is high, the di di disruption we say in, in English. So COVID nineteen is pandemic is telling us that we have to try to build shorter uh, value chains, uh, and this is a call for promoting uh, urban agriculture and local value chains, so that uh, production is done around the big cities and uh, all the value chains are organized so that we can move quickly the, the, the food produces uh, from the production side to where it's, it's processed and to the markets, etc. So this is a key lesson from, uh, from COVID that uh, we need to start looking for shorter secrets, uh, shorter value chain and build uh, value chain uh, um, around the big cities, meaning we need to promote peri-urban agriculture and, and local value chains. What I'm going to, uh, to present now is how this can be done. So I have chosen seven selected uh, policy tools uh, to improving uh, urban food systems. Uh, of course, you have more than what I'm going to present, but I, I thought those seven uh, policy tools are, are quite uh, critical. Before I move to I move to presenting those policy tools, I I just like to to again say here that just like the dentist or the mechanic, uh, governments uh, achieve the uh, development result only if they devise uh, relevant policy instruments. And policy uh, does not mean vague statements. Uh, policy means a very concrete policy instrument that work for the people. So let's look at uh, uh, some of those uh, tools. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, spatial planning. And, uh, and production infrastructure. Uh, in around our cities, uh, we know that urbanization is taking all the lands. So uh, if you don't have a special planning policy uh, to secure agricultural lands around the cities and make sure that they are, they are reserved for agriculture and protecting, so that uh, uh, commodities like uh, vegetables, mushroom, poultry can be produced around the big cities. Uh, those uh, spaces have to be uh, protected against uh, expansion of cities. Uh, and they need uh, infrastructure, production infrastructure, yeah, irrigation, greenhouses. Uh, they can be made as a, a special economic zone. Uh, it's advisable that they are private sector led. Uh, governments 
central, local, uh, provincial movies through uh, private uh, PPP arrangement and uh, through blended financing arrangement. I will talk about that later. So that is about farms uh, around the cities, but the spatial planning also needs to incorporate uh, the food distribution infrastructure in the cities, the supermarket, the malls, the convenience stores, where uh, they will be located, because the cities are growing very fast, and uh, usually without uh, any 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 planning, and uh, uh, in the in the planning, those um, food food distribution infrastructures might be forgotten. It's important to uh, to consider them in in the planning. Uh, second tool uh, is the need uh, to de-risk uh, urban agriculture. Uh, the recommendation here is, is that uh, uh, governments at all levels uh, need to set up uh, a facility to, uh, to upgrade the organization of value chains uh, for priority commodities. Uh, a facility as well to share risks eh, in, by uh, guaranteeing farmers and agribusinesses uh, promote uh, insurance and provide incentives for banks to lend to value chains. So uh, to the risk agriculture, we need uh, to, to, to upgrade, to improve the organization of the value chains for, for the, those priorities that are grown around the cities. And we need to share uh, the risks. We need to guarantee the farmers, we need to promote insurance and, and provide incentives to banks to lend to agriculture. You don't have to go into details, but those are very known uh, policy tools that are used uh, efficiently, and we have more and, and more good examples in Africa. Third uh, tools uh, is uh, the need to promote uh, inclusiveness, but in a smart way. Uh, here, when I, when I mean uh, inclusiveness, I mean the, in, the, in, uh, include uh, the youth, women, uh, the vulnerable into the value chains. This is particularly important if you think uh, job creation. Uh, so here again, we need uh, a facility uh, to blend public resources with bank financing by uh, providing some matching grants to the to the to youth, women, and the vulnerable. Uh, it's possible to subsidize uh, interest on agricultural loans. Uh, support trainings because young people, when they come in a value chain, they don't necessarily know uh, the job. So they will need uh, to be to be trained, and, and we need a public sector to set up a facility for doing so. Uh, it's these uh, in inclusiveness facilities need to be combined with uh, the risk sharing uh, measures that I presented earlier. Uh, the risk sharing measures can also benefit from, from these uh, vulnerable people. And by doing so, we will be able to effectively uh, increase uh, inclusiveness and make sure that uh, we get uh, young people, women, uh, and poor people into, uh, into the value chains. Four uh, is the, 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 our cities in Africa uh, are not equipped with the, what we call the food market hub. Uh, this becomes more and more important. So, so here in South Africa, uh, Johannesburg and, uh, and Pretoria have their own uh, 
Mark and Herb. Uh, every normal big city in the world has uh, a big Mark and Herb. Uh, those uh, Mark and Herb, um, they are commercial, uh, commercial infrastructure where all the food stores uh, come usually uh, in the night and uh, and uh, by 4 4 a.m uh, business start taking place and uh, the, the the food producers leave uh, that place and we can find them in the market uh, from from eight o'clock uh, so it's it's a big usually a big well-built infrastructure uh, for hygiene uh, very very practical uh, it's also uh, usually a company. And uh, in many cases, uh, the good examples show that uh, uh, that company used to be uh, a joint venture between municipality, private companies, uh, family organization, and possibly uh, central government. Uh, for example, the, 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 Mark, the Rome, uh, the city of Rome's Mark and Herb is a joint venture between uh, the municipality of Rome, the central government, and and some some private uh, private firms. So it's it's a PPP arrangement. Uh, this is very important because the food market helps they, they structure value chain uh, by linking uh, the production subsystem with the wholesalers and uh, and retailers. So this is a very important tool to think about. It needs a big investment, but it can go through PPP arrangement so that public sector can just provide uh, incentives. Uh, five, uh, 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 the social protection policy to ensure that uh, um, everyone can access uh, food. Uh, we know very well the, full, the, the school feeding policy, uh, particularly in the poor suburbs, but in, in some countries, the school feeding policy is even everywhere. Uh, when the kids go to school, they are sure to access some, some specific uh, food uh, in school. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the a food aid uh, policy for the vulnerable, uh, with a good targeting system so that uh, the, the needy people are the ones that will benefit from me. This can take the form of, of, of cash transfer uh, through uh, mobile phone, or it can take the, 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 uh, the form of in-kind uh, distribution. Uh, better cash transfer than in-kind distribution, but when there is a, a disaster and we need to react uh, immediately, uh, in-kind distribution is also welcome. Uh, education campaigns on nutrition, uh, we need to invest on it. And uh, uh, municipalities, uh, uh, provincial government, central government need to enforce quality standards uh, to protect the consumers. These are a few elements of, uh, of social uh, protection policy. Uh, six, uh, the environmental uh, policy uh, for all those uh, production sites, but also processing, abattoir, uh, uh, the, the food market hub. Uh, we need clear uh, environmental norms and rules. Uh, we need uh, government to enforce compliance. And uh, we need to monitor the state of environment around uh, production and commercial uh, inf infrastructures. And seven, uh, it's important to monitor uh, the, the urban uh, food systems, uh, particularly uh, to watch uh, and monitor what is the level of malnutrition. Uh, the supply uh, parameters uh, in, a, in a big city where our food is coming from, uh, uh, is it still coming from very far? Uh, in, in our chicken is still coming from, from Brazil. Uh, Why we could get our own uh, young people to produce chicken around our cities. 
uh, the quality parameters, uh, jobs uh, that is being created uh, in the agricultural food systems, and uh, the performance of local value chains. And, and these uh, observatory uh, will inform the revision of, of, of the policy instruments. If, if uh, things are not going well, it means that um, the policy instrument that we are devising are not, are not uh, right. They need to be, uh, to be improved. Again, uh, my message here is that governments uh, being central, provincial, or local, meaning municipalities, they can only um, achieve uh, sustainable food systems only if they, uh, they put effort in using uh, the kind of appropriate policy instruments that I've, I've described here. And that's the end of the, the presentation. Thank you. Okay, excellent, Alain. Thank you very much. And yeah, that's. I think that was clear that uh, we need to uh, improve how systematic we are in developing food systems around the cities, and uh, you know what policies need to be put in place. We are going to have a um, comment. Um, discussion after all the presentations. So please, um, colleagues and uh, participants, you can use the uh, webinar chat to put your um, comments or questions. And also please use the Q&A um, on the bottom of the webinar uh, to put your comments or questions. Thank you very much, Elaine, again. And um, we will come back to you uh, with the questions after all the presenters. Um, let me please invite um, the second presenter, and we should hear from Arusha uh, City, but uh, Paul Curry will uh, help us uh, and take us through the presentation as Arusha colleagues couldn't join us today. Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks, Barbara. Um, and uh, colleagues with uh, indulgence, please allow me to speak on behalf uh, of Arusha, given that our um, contact unfortunately could not join us. Um, we learned a number of really interesting lessons from an exchange uh, that ICLI ran between Arusha and Antananarivo, uh, Arusha in Tanzania and Antananarivo in Madagascar. Um, and so on the topic of um, involving youth and women in food systems and allowing them and uh, supporting them to prosper, um, we had a really interesting insight from Arusha um, City Council, who as part of a national program um, are providing 10% of their own revenue to um, youth, women, and people with disabilities uh, in the form of loans. Um, next slide, please. So a youth development fund was initiated by the Tanzanian uh, national government uh, in the early 1900s um, with the aim to support uh, involvement of youth uh, in food systems uh, in local governments. Um, unfortunately, in the beginning, it resulted in poor payment and management, and so they reframed it uh, to require local governments to mobilize their own source revenue and to set aside 10% of this um, for revolving loans. So as they get paid back, they can be offered uh, back to uh, youth, women, uh, and people with disabilities. Um, there have been a number of uh, uh, forms of research done on uh, its effectiveness. And it differs across local governments, but uh, Arusha um, has shown really great success. Um, next slide. So sharing this, um, about 285 youth, uh, 870 women, and 36 people with disabilities from 25 wards in Arusha uh, were trained uh, on leadership, uh, entrepreneurship, um, and loan repayment, as well as, as, well as life skills. Um, as part of the program uh, in 2017 to 19. Um, soft loans were provided to 290 women groups, 285 youth groups, uh, and 12 groups of people with disabilities, um, all totaling um, just over 3 uh, billion Tanzanian shillings. Uh, and so from this, uh, the reflection is that a large number of women, youth, and people with disabilities have employed themselves across urban agriculture, livestock keeping, uh, restaurants, saloons, agro-processing, uh, and resale of secondhand clothes. Next slide. 
they note some challenges uh, in terms of uh, how they need to support some beneficiaries to attend trainings uh, and some were not uh, serious about them. Uh, some group members uh, move to new cities, which puts the burden on the remaining group to uh, repay the loan, which uh, results in some defaulting. Um, and then uh, they're burdened by many requests, which is uh, a great sign uh, of interest um, uh, to receive these loans. Um, it should be noted that the loans uh, are interest-free loans uh, that just require repayment, um, and Arusha has reported that uh, the loans uh, are taken up quite well. Next slide. Are repaid quite well, excuse me. Um, these are two uh, groups, um, women uh, on the left, women uh, bringing up goats. This is the goat pen, uh, and they release them out um, uh, for feeding and movement. Uh, and on the right, a youth uh, group who's doing horticulture in the center of Arusha city. Um, and here, uh, to reference some of uh, Elaine's points, uh, spatial planning is really important to protect uh, these uh, urban agriculture areas um, and, uh, and ecosystem services. So I think for, from our perspective, this is just a really interesting uh, show of how a good national policy um, has shown good implementation at the local level um, and needs to work um, across levels of government. Thanks very much. No, thank you very much, Paul. And it's a pity that we couldn't have uh, Arusha colleagues here, but you did a great job. Um, I think this is um, for our part, uh, participants. This is uh, this is kind of like end of what we wanted to present as a background and um, as a, from the policy perspective. And now we are going to hear from uh, three entrepreneurs, um, and we will start. We will start with also um, we will start with uh, Shinabo Dieng. Um, who is the co-founder and manager of Maya Bamako and who will give us um, live experience about what is it to be an um, entrepreneur, youth and women entrepreneur uh, in Mali, uh, working in agribusiness and consulting sector. So um, Shinabo, after, um, after her degree on economics from the Sorbonne University and master in international strategy and marketing, she decided to return to Mali in 2015 to contribute to the country's development. And she began her career in a USAID, but um, you know, rapidly she um, developed her enterprise after visiting Brazil, well, where she saw what impact agribusiness development had on country development itself. So what is really interesting about Shinabu is that um, she not only founded um, the Agri Enterprise but also a consulting firm and she is a committed to the cause of women and young people and devotes part of her time to coaching young entrepreneurs. Um, her leadership in uh, entrepreneurship and her social commitment have earned her several distinctions including Young Francophone Entrepreneur Prize awarded by OIF in 2019, Sadio Business Prize in Mali, and she's also laureate of AFD Social Inclusive Business Camp, a nearly fellow and winner of the Thousand Entrepreneurs Challenge of the France Africa 2020 Summit. Jamie, welcoming Shinabon. Um, Shinabon, the floor is yours. You have six minutes. Thank you. Oui, bonjour, bonjour à tous. Uh, merci beaucoup pour uh, Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me to this very interesting webinar. My name is Sinebou Diang. As Barbara said, I am based in Mali. I'll be delighted to give you a presentation on Maya and the different challenges that we have when it comes to local consumption of food in Mali. Can you share your screen? Oui. Yes. Okay. Donc, uh, there you go. Can you see my presentation right now? Are you able to see my presentation? Okay. Yes, we are. Okay. Wonderful. So we are a 100% company from Mali that creates grocery products, food products. So we started off with 
an issue because when I came back to Mali in 2015 after spending 10 years abroad, that there were very few agri food, local agri food and qualitative agri food products in the local market. So I ended up eating the same products in Mali as the ones that I was eating in Europe, which was very paradoxical for me. This is why I decided to test local production, including spices. And we tackled three problems in Mali. First, there's a, an issue for vegetable management. We know that 30% of vegetable production is thrown away because the industry is not able to process it, to store it, or to valorize it. And by the way, 115% of the agricultural woman is made up of women, women workers. And this, the fact that this production is thrown away leads to a lack in revenue for women. And also we talked about unemployment for men and for women and youth. Also, I realized that African consumers eat pr products that are not developed for African consumers because the products that we're getting from Asia, Europe or the Middle East are products that we use by default because they are not in line with our tastes. because they're not in line with our traditional cuisine. The company that we have created called Maya is an agri-food company that not only respects value chains, but also local cuisine and local traditions. This is a typical range of products that we have at Maya since the company was created. This is the type of products that we have been developing. How were we able to find a solution to this issue, to these issues? Well, first, we created partnerships with farmer organizations to collect their vegetables. And with, so with farming organizations, we hired young men and young women to work with us. So we created sauces and pastries with spices and local cereals, local spices, dedicated to the African market. And we were able, and we are now able to market these products in the ECOWAS region, including Mali. This is an example of our products. We work uh, on, on spices. We have puree, pepper, chili. Now, we also work on breadcrumbs because now we know that African, African consumers are used to form products. Therefore, we created breadcrumbs for uh, the taste of African people. We also manufacture products based on out of honey, etc., etc., and also crepe dough. So this company was created in 2017. At the time, I was still working for an NGO for USAID. And as I told you, I had trouble finding products that I liked. So I started creating these products, making these products in my own, in my own home. And just, I wanted to show people that you could create your own food without using imported products. I don't know about you, but in my region, it feels like the products that are imported, the, the qualitative products, and we think that the local products are not as good. And so I started with Maya, who was my cook. I started creating my own food. So in 2017, we created the company. 2018, we started the production unit. And in 2019, we raised funds. And in 2020, we scaled up. And in 2020, we were able to invest in industrial equipment in order to scale up the production. So what is the philosophy behind Maya? It's about connecting the rural and the urban worlds. Western Africa tends to valorize what comes from elsewhere even though our countryside and our fields are full with incredible products so i just wanted to create this link between urban and rural women uh, we wanted to create a bridge between these two worlds this is the number of products that we were able to 
developed since the beginning of the company. You know that in Mali, local production is incredibly popular between 2017 and 2018. We more than doubled our, our turnover in 2019. Uh, we had a lower turnover because we had issues with fundings. Therefore, we had to focus mainly our activities on finding funds. And it's actually in 2019 that I stopped working on production, but I worked more in consulting. Why? Because I did not have access to fundings. Therefore, I had to have a side activity in order to then invest this money into my company. So at the end of 2019, we were able to open our capital to an investment fund which really helps us in terms of the perspectives for 2020. Now, about our target markets, we want to target average middle-class African women because the products that we are manufacturing are niche products. We distribute in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Senegal. Here are the different channels that we are using. First, supermarkets, grocery stores, caterers, and e-commerce platforms. And due to COVID-19, we also had to do direct sale for consumers, so delivery of food at home. Based on the studies that we were able to carry out, we observed that spice, spices and sauces in Mali is a market that is very buoyant in the ECOWAS area, as well as in Mali. African women use, uh, on average, seven spices for a, dip, for a meal, while European women only use two spices, which shows how buoyant and relevant this market is. These are CFA francs figures, but it shows that if we get the right support, companies such as Maya can get up to 21 billion CFA francs in the market in the ECOWAS region. As I said, the company was created three years ago, but over the past three years, we were able to accomplish a lot. To do so, we really relied on our strengths. First, this is a very strong brand, a local brand, which creates a sense of pride in consumers. We have a high capacity of creation, of innovation of products, and we also have access to good packaging, qualitative packaging. Now, the different challenges that we had, we had issues finding middle management that was efficient. Companies such as ours cannot offer high revenue to, or high wages to their employees. Therefore, we have issues finding the right resources who want to work for companies in the agribusiness here in Mali. We are not very well known outside of social networks because the only communication channel that we use is social networks. We also have less negotiating power in the face of local stakeholders because they are used to working with markets more than industrial companies. We know that the middle class in Africa is growing, which is very beneficial for companies such as our company. And we have technical partners and the government that are interested in the agribusiness. So this is one of the strengths and opportunities to seize. And of course, we rely heavily on new technologies in order to tackle international, the international market. Now, when it comes to the threats, the market is not very regulated. Started a company in the agri-food business is not hard. Any company can do it in Mali. The market is not regulated. There's high competition from imported products, which are much more competitive than our products. And as you may see, we are, as you may be aware, we are in facing an economic and health and political crisis, which is a threat to our companies. What are the difficulties that we are confronted with currently? First, access to fundings. We had access to financing recently, as I said, in 2019. But to scale up our production and to save at high scale, we need to keep raising 
funds, which is difficult, especially in the security context that we have in mind. Second difficulty, we don't have access to commodities, qualitative raw material and commodities in mind. As you may know, local producers have a production mode method that is family run. So first we are subject to seasons and on top of that it's difficult to create contracts, strict and rigorous contracts with these non-industrial stakeholders. Last week I made a request for a quote to have uh, the price of chili everywhere in Africa and I got more response from companies in Ghana or South Africa than, in comp than from companies in Mali. So it just shows how the networks are not organized here in Mali. The third difficulty is to make sure that African consumers know, we need to let them know that local products can actually be more qualitative and better than imported products. And this requires investing in communication and in marketing. And this is not something that a company can afford, a small company such as our can afford. Finally, our business model is very simple. We want to advertise and value, uh, value chains of vegetables, spices, and cereals through agricultural products such as chili, ginger, garlic, celery, honey, corn, in order to contribute to the development of agricultural value chains, including small producers and supply chains in order to increase revenue. We use specific processing techniques such as pasteurization, uh, drying, drying techniques, caramelization, and we develop uh, products that can be food products of high quality, innovative products that are highly nutritious, easy to use, and affordable. This is what we want to give and offer to our consumers, either they should be distributed in large markets or supermarkets or delivered at home. Here is our team. We have 21 members of staff. Eight people are permanent workers. Thank you. No, that was, that was excellent, Sinabo. Um, thank you very much for this inspiring uh, presentation. I, I already want to buy half of your product. It's 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 it really looks excellent, and um, and and yeah, I live in South Africa and Southern Africa in general. It's saddening to see how this diversity it's really not transferred. If you go to your um, to your to the shop um, in here, that you will see a lot of European um, or, or foreign products. Um, so so yeah, so this is excellent um, excellent um, thing that you are doing. And I, I, am, I am sure that people have already a uh, lot of questions. So please put them into the Q&A for Sioban and we will come back to you in the discussion session. So we are a little bit um, delayed this time, uh, but let me just jump into the next presenter. Uh, thank you very much, Shinabo. Uh, let me just jump into the next presenter, who is the Paul Shepard. Uh, he is the managing director of Future Farm uh, in South Africa, and ha he is a dedicated manager with over four years of experience, um, and he invests in youth employment uh, innovation, focusing on urban production. So, Paul, um, if you can put on your camera and the presentation, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Barbara. Can um, can you hear me? All right. And is I my video? Yes, your okay. video. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, I'm just going to be chatting a little bit about in South Africa and a bit about what what we've done in this in this urban farming space and sort of what we like to do. Is everything working? Can you? All I can see is my screen. So if you just tell me if they're right. Excellent. You can continue. Perfect. Okay, so just a bit about who we are. Um, so we focus on hydroponic farming, utilizing, uh, you know, as little space and water and inputs as we can throughout uh, the various different urban environments in South Africa. Um, our target is to try and grow herbicide and pesticide free produce uh, all throughout the year using as little inputs 
as possible so that we can go across two different various locations in Africa where water and fertile soil is scarce and into urban environments which is close to the markets, close to the off takers and the retailers and sort of plant an agricultural footstep um, or footprint rather in these local environments. So a bit about our company, we've built over 22 of these um, urban hydroponic farms now, uh, throughout mainly throughout Johannesburg and the Gauteng uh, area. A lot of them, in fact, in the CBD of Johannesburg on rooftops, as well as inside buildings under LED grow lights. And in fact, some are even underground where we grow um, things like mushrooms and stuff in dark environments. Um, so, yeah, as I said, our, our, our target is to scale up urban farming to mitigate that transport um, and value chain system where you have a lot, a lot of delay on produce coming from outer regions and from overseas and setting up a local proven technology that works sort of on, on scalable across any African town. Uh, why hydroponics? I think it's quite important to, to, to highlight the, the water usage is 95% less than any sort of commercial scale farming that we, we can see today. Uh, value with, add, add with this, we can maximize our yields with our vertical uh, growth system. So what we actually do is we stack our plants, especially indoors, you can stack them under LED grow lights and grow plants at a maximum yield. You don't need lots of space, you don't need lots of soil, you don't need lots of water. Um, a large thing that we have seen is our consistency in pro in produce because it's so it's almost like ag tech side of farming. So it's actually so easy to just mimic conditions, control conditions, and you, you'll get a you'll get a systematic response of your produce every single month. Um, the quality of the produce is obviously got no herbicides, no pesticides, no insecticides. It's completely carbon neutral. Um, so no fertilizer goes into the leaves or anywhere affecting the plant that is consumed by, by the clients. Um, there's a, a couple of pictures on, on what our urban farming initiative looks like. This at the bottom here is uh, in the city center of Joburg. And this little farm produces about 4,000 plants per month, uh, you know, over a 200 square meter area. So fully greenhouse equipped with netting and plastic and a full reticulation system. A large part of this program has been constructing farms towards training and having a shift of the knowledge through our youth and uh, training program that we have here in Joburg. So we've trained over 100 trainees on these farms. And in fact, they, through a, through a program in Joburg, they actually own these farms themselves. And we train them on running the business and running the, the farm setup. And then they're actually encouraged to go off and find their own market and run their own business. And then later on, we, we would build another farm for them as they plan to grow. Um, so one of the one of the attributes we found about this thing is that is that I mean this farm is about 200 meters away from its client, so they don't actually have to have any cold storage. Um, they harvest, they pack, they deliver about an hour later. Uh, so I mean it's really mitigating one of the one of the one of the elements of produce, which is cold storage. It doesn't have to be on rooftops, as you can see. Uh, we do do ground-based urban farms, such as this one. Um, Again, here, here you're looking at a 200 square meter farm producing over 5,000 uh, plants per month. Obviously, this produce ranges from not just lettuce and leafy greens as in the past, but with the development of systems, we've now got towards tomatoes, strawberries, high value vegetables, micro vegetables, and things like that. I'll just go through. The training in indoor farming uh, is a large growth in demand on indoor farming as it is now climate uh, it's it's climate completely climate controlled system. So we have lettuces going from seedling to harvest stage in 20 to 28 days. Um, what we what we found is actually this farm that was built is right next door to Food Lovers Markets uh, distribution center. So we actually wheel it out of that garage and then it goes straight into into um, into production. So I think one of the key elements that we're trying to we're trying to highlight here is that you can grow this produce no matter the location. Obviously, ESCOM throws its challenges to us. So when these lights go off, we revert back to the, the rooftop farms. But it's important to know that, that this program can be implemented anywhere. Uh, doesn't have to be indoor, doesn't have to be on top of roofs. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's got a really diverse application. 
Um, a lot, as I said, a large part of the of the project is driven towards the uh, the drive to promote the skills transfer. So a lot of this project was created towards uh, ownership, mentoring, and transfer of of the actual farms. So each 22 farms are owned by 20 to 30 different people um, that are now trying to grow and sort of double their farms as the years as the years go on. So it's it's a small presentation, but it's just a bit about us and and what we do. Uh, so yeah, obviously looking to take that to the rest of, of Africa. Yeah. No, excellent, Paul. Thank you very much. You were very time conscious, and I really thank you for that. Uh, that that's excellent experience and um, you know we always hear that urban agriculture is an untapped potential and can solve a lot of food security issues in the cities but we also know that the statement is a bit over optimistic uh, so from my yeah. experience I wanted to know what what is what is what is your you know what would you say is it is it that um, that that big pot potential but let's let's keep this discussion for later on we still have two presenters okay. uh, if you can please, uh, switch off your screen uh, sharing because I see myself twice. Okay, Thank you very perfect. much, Paul. That was that was excellent presentation. And um, colleagues, please put uh, put questions in Q and A uh, so that um, our speakers can respond to you directly. I also see that there is a live conversation in the chat. So let's keep this conversation. We are a little bit delayed. Uh, as always, so um, I don't know how much time we will have for a real discussion and it would be a pity not to take this time and use this time to uh, to ask your questions and to get response from our speakers. So let me just um, jump to the next speaker and we are going to hear from loving um, Kobusingie, and I probably pronounced it incorrectly. She is the CEO and co-founder in Kati Farms in Kampala. Uh, and Katim Farms, it's a woman-owned small business founded in 2012, uh, which has built strong relationships with the local fish farmers and manu manufacture of fish products uh, that are most innovative and new on the market. So it's uh, another experience uh, following the one from uh, Shinabo um, from Uganda. So Lavin, um, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, and uh, I'm grateful to FAO for the invitation. I am waiting for the slide, please, if it's ready. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Next slide, please. Yeah, Cut is, uh, as Barbara said, is a small agrofish uh, enterprise. Uh, we started in 2012, uh, but before I joined, or before I founded Cutty Farm, I worked with farmers uh, for more than five years. And uh, out of the experience that I gained from uh, Fish Farmers Cooperative Society, uh, after discovering that they, it was very challenging for farmers to access markets, I had passion to venture into uh, fish processing, marketing, and trade. Uh, with the, armed with the 800 US dollars, I decided to go into uh, fish uh, research and development but my focus was on product development and I, I, I am able to, I was able to come up with the fish sausages, which were our flagship product. By then, we've taken assistance from the Uganda Industrial Research Institute, uh, which actually uh, gave me a lot of uh, knowledge. Uh, without the institute, I would not have been able to to proceed because I had issues uh, to do with the capital, I had issues to do with the space, uh, I had issues uh, on how I really needed technical knowledge on food processing and trade. Uh, I didn't. I needed working space. Uh, I also needed the institutional encouragement needed by all young entrepreneurs to keep going, especially uh, when you feel you lack everything. All you have is the passion to
to move. So we started with 100 kilos. Uh, after product development, I, I was able to make uh, production, which started from 100 kilos a day, uh, and demand was actually very encouraging. So uh, we moved by the fourth month, third month, fifth month, we would be able to supply around 500 kilos uh, of fish sausages. Kati uh, farms directly employ 38 staff, and mainly 60% of our staff are women and youth. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, Kati Farms, uh, our value chain is just simple and it is focusing on how do we bring more fish to the people and inclusively without segregating the poor, everyone has to have fish. So as I already mentioned earlier, uh, the chart flow is just this simple from Uganda Industrial Research Institute uh, that is where it all started. And from there, we were able to get armed with training uh, and at the business incubator, uh, where we had the technical experience, we had the, the, the marketing experience, the sales experience. Uh, and after that, you see a lot of prayers in our value chain. We have policy makers. Uh, you can't do a business without the involvement of policy. So the Ministry of Fisheries in Uganda was very supportive. Uh, we also got support from uh, other development partners like uh, the FAO Managed Smart Fish Project, which, which actually ended. Uh, we were a part of that and through them we were able to have access to markets because we were able to have exhibition sponsored to go for exhibitions where we were able to talk about our, our new innovation. So from here, we were able to have public stick. Like maybe we have TV and radio coverage, newspaper coverage. And with all this, you have to have a professional way of operation. We have legal advisors, we have uh, farmers, and the farmers are the suppliers of our raw material which was very, very key in making sure that we have the business uh, raw material supplies coming in when we had limited resources. Uh, $800 was not even enough to take me through the product development stage. So I was able to convince the farmers that I have, I have a market for you and uh, I will pay you after three weeks. I will give you checks which will be but deposited to your accounts. These were post-dated checks. It is just based on promise and trust. So you move from farmers, you go to the processing plant, we have the fish, it is processed, it is, it is taken to the market. And the market here, we refer to retailers, restaurants, informal street roasters, and those who want to import to take to other countries. Uh, and in Uganda, we by then had about 20, 20 hotels and 30 supermarkets who trusted us with the, with, with the supply. Because when it comes to market retention, you must make sure you have enough uh, to supply the market. Because most retailers don't want to take entrepreneurs' products because we supply one day and when they call you the following day, you are nowhere to be seen. So we have to keep the market. Once you start, there's no looking backward. Uh, so, uh, that is how it triggers down to employment because by giving uh, these retailers uh, also employ other people and we also employ the transporters get jobs and everyone is, inclu is included in our value chain. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, this is why Cati Farms was able to succeed with this new innovation. Uh, when we began, uh, there was no person producing fish sausages in, in Africa. Uh, so an innovative product is one thing that all entrepreneurs must actually look out to when you, you are venturing into a business. Do research, think about how best you can penetrate the market because it's not something that is just there for, for you. 
you must come with something new to convince your clients that I am here and I will not be going in a very short time. So the development of the fish sausages uh, was able to give us uh, potential to give us um, you know a competitive advantage over any potential customers that would arise in the future and we are still the leading producer of fish sausages in Africa because of quality we, we make sure that the quality of our products is is continuously improving and at a lower price and at affordable packages uh, because we don't want to have uh, things that people will will, will, will not make, make use of. Um, also, customizing our products to customers' uh, taste and preferences. In urban cities, uh, people would love to buy only what they want to use. If, for example, I have a family of one or two, uh, I don't need to buy a five kilogram, uh, you know, uh, fish. So what I will do, I will just go and look out for products that are, that are fit within the budget that I have. For example, I may decide to take a, a, a quarter of sausages. So can you, as an entrepreneur, be able to produce what these people are looking forward to? Uh, so, uh, Len, we also have unlimited supply of raw materials. So when we started, we, we had abundance of, fish, of farmed fish because the farmers did not have where to sell their products. So it was, also one of the, uh, the reasons why we were able to, to go to the market uh, very, very quickly uh, and succeed. Uh, then also this uh, regular endorsement boosts entrepreneurs' confidence. Uh, as I already said before, when we started uh, with the URI giving us all that uh, privileges that we got, uh, the working space uh, and also the, the mentorship, uh, uh, from here, we, you get a lot of uh, uh, shows, conferences, where you're able to, to go and talk about your, your business. And, and then from here, we also got awards uh, from Rubber Bank Foundation, we were able to win an, an award, which was financially actually very supportive because it was a, a money. And from that, we were able to, to buy equipment and uh, to continue uh, with the business to where it is today. Next slide, please. Um, how do we sustain, uh, sustain uh, how enhancement and sustainability uh, of urban food systems? Uh, in, our, in, in, in our case, in Kati Farms, uh, we made sure that uh, we create and explore uh, and deliver quality fish products to satisfy the needs of our target market. Uh, when you are an entrepreneur, you are not targeting every, everyone, but you really have that specific target market that you are looking out to. Uh, so we really knew what we wanted and we went for it. And we do this at a profit because this is a profit uh, enterprise. It's not an NGO. Uh, secondly, we do promotion of sustainable fish processing uh, technologies like now we, we embrace the solar systems, uh, we, we, we have um, a healthy uh, uh, fish that is smoked, uh, te technology, uh, the fish that we use, the machinery that we use, is it cancerous free? Because people have to read about the product first, so we must make sure that we are ahead of technology. Uh, we save power, uh, we, we reduce smoke, we reduce diseases, and this is also part of our marketing advantage as well. Uh, also in adding value to prevent deterioration, waste management, all that is part of. And then healthy competition whereby we do uh, continually invest in making our products much better and, and affordable. Uh, and by doing this, I think for urban cities or for urban food systems to be sustainable, people should duplicate our model because uh, it is uh, not very capital intensive and it is also, uh, it includes all these processes of food safety uh, and HACCP systems that all food uh, producers must, uh, must embrace. Uh, next slide, please. And our involvement uh, of the youth and women in our food system is as follows. 
uh, as you can see from the first photograph, uh, we make sure that we have 60% uh, of the workers in our, in our, in our plant is, are women and youth. Uh, and there, the second photo is me with the, the women. You can see them back in the background doing the work. Uh, also at, uh, at harvesting, where we are harvesting fish. You see a lot of fish being harvested from farms. Uh, the, the people doing the harvesting, the people doing the packaging, uh, the people doing the, it's only in transportation where we have no ladies because the trucks are still not uh, gender friendly. They are still mainly made for men, so it's not easy. But even here at the sales center, this is our shop in Kampala where you can come and purchase fish. We employ women and youth uh, and we, we think we really have tried our best to make sure that we involve the youth and train them. I have seen some of my trainees, uh, interns who come as interns and instead of going to look for jobs, they, they go and start up small businesses for themselves. And to me, that is very encouraging. Next That's slide. excellent. That's excellent, Loving. Thank you very much. Sorry that I have to, uh, I have to cut you here, but uh, we are very bad in time. But uh, th this is excellent experience. And, and from, your, from your experience, I really remember that I have, um, I, have um, I know that you have uh, had a, a lot of struggles in actually finding the right institutions that could support you to, uh, to standardize your product or to test your product. Uh, uh, including the food safety uh, offices or uh, some 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 uh, institutions that could um, that that you know that that uh, research on food. Uh, so that's that's really interesting. And it coming back to what Alan was talking about. Um, oh, sorry, I thought it was it was last slide. So you have still this one uh, of your products. Thank you. Should I continue? Would you like to just go, go through the products quickly okay, and then the, you, you just wrap up, please. This is our product range and uh, there are many. We have over 17 products in our production line. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've also had challenges and uh, there are many. And uh, one of them is uh, being in a landlocked country like Uganda uh, you, getting material packaging is very hard. Uh, processing equipment is not available. We depend on importing almost everything and it is very expensive. And uh, lastly, the capital is very, very needed to invest here is also much. And the banks that are in my country at the moment uh, don't want to invest in a, in a projects that take long and uh, not easy to explain like fish because they think like fish is how do you get profit from a perishable product. So those are one of the challenges that we really face. Uh, and we need to now in also introduce the e-commerce and ICT. Uh, we need these experts. We need, the, uh, we need the capital to invest here after COVID-19. Now we are looking forward to better ways uh, and, and being compliant with the new marketing systems that are available. Uh, I think the last slide now. Yeah, thank you so much. Any other questions I will answer during the Q and A session. Thank yes, you exactly. Inviting. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Lovin. It was really excellent. And uh, as as one person wrote here in the in the chat, uh, we would like to taste the fish sausages. It's not a very common product. So thank you very much for sharing your experience. I don't think we will really have time through the Q&A session. So participants, please pose a question for Lavin and, and Lavin, you can uh, answer directly in a Q&A session. Uh, we, uh, before, before we, um, we, we do the questions, we have a last speaker who uh, is Ms. Fanta Guindo, who is the Quality Manager of Institute of Rural Economy at the Laboratory of Food Technology of Bamako. And I would like to ask you, um, Fanta, to, um, to, to give us very brief uh, inputs. Thank you very much. Over to you. Uh, merci beaucoup. Bonjour à tout le monde. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fanta Guindo. I'm an engineer technologist at the uh, Laboratory on Food Technology 
within the Institute of Rural Economy. So I do research in Mali. I'm the quality manager of the Food Technology Laboratory. I'm an engineering technologist and I am also a member uh, and of the board of director for Amasa Africa. It's a Malian NGO and I'm in charge of promotion of women. So I'm a member of the board of this NGO, Amasa Africa. And as part of my activities, I carry out research related work. So I carry out research project, but I also support companies in for the processing, the preservation and the quality of agri-food products. And we also train SMEs in the agri-food sector, cooperatives also, but also organizations and groups of farmers in terms of good hygiene practices, best practices, and manufacturing of agri-food products. And we help them with the standardization of their processes. We also create training modules and improved techniques for entrepreneurs in the agri-food sector for processing, preservation of cereals, for instance, but also legumes and animal products and animal origin products, such as uh, milk, for instance, so everything related to hygiene and quality, really. And at the same time, uh, I supervise students and trainees from different schools and universities, as well as vocational training centers in the food processing industry. Sometimes they come to us uh, for their end of curriculum internship. But we also do incubation for young people and young companies in the processing or agri-food product company, uh, sector rather. So we do mentoring, we train them, we coach them in their, call it in their product development, but also in their quality controls. So we support them during an incubation period of between three to six months. So they're supported by researchers. I'd like to talk about a very innovative program uh, which is uh, supported by LTA and also Amasa Afrique Vert. So Amasa Green Africa, it's an NGO, as I mentioned earlier, that is uh, based in Mali. But they also work, they work a lot for the agri-food product sector, for the support of products. So this is a program called, called Hub IIT. It was financed by AFD and, implement, and then implemented by TechDev, which is a French NGO, they work, they help us with uh, technical support and this hub IIT um, is supported also by the private, uh, sec the center of private sector and it's a technological support service in Mali which helps uh, and facilitate access to technological information in the agri-food processing sector. So now this program uh, is made up of a team of experts, national and international experts. I'm the uh, technological referent for this program. So we support companies. And this support is about helping companies in their technological development. You heard the presentation of the Maya company uh, and they were helped by this program. So we help in terms of technology development for companies in Mali. We have three technological reference and in France we have this technological support service remote service, SATD, and with a network of African and French experts. So when we can't find the answer at local level, well, we ask for support from the SATD, this technological support service with this network of African and French experts. This is a program that is helpful for Chad, Senegal, Mali, and is currently being developed in Burkina Faso. So this is something, this is a program that is being extended to other countries. Who is this uh, program targeting? Well, mainly uh, micro and small or medium-sized companies, but also formal or informal groupings. 
in food processing. Because earlier, the, the previous speaker from Uganda said that usually there are needs, but how can companies make sure that they develop the right products? Well, we need research. You can have great ideas, but how can you develop the product? How can you how can you go about it? This is what we're here for. We help with support. We give technological support, support and training. We have different technical files for each product and how you can process them. So we help and support companies. We coach them. We try to explain them how they can standardize their production. We train them on different aspects of the food processing system. So this program is for micro, small, and medium-sized companies, but also formal and informal groupings in the food processing sector. We mainly uh, work uh, within a radius of 50 kilometers around the macro. We are also working in the south region of Bamako. We, we just created this cell two or three months ago in the south of the country. But for making this a continuous program, we are trying to work in other regions of Mali. So we want to, to really extend our activities to other regions of Mali. So how do we support these companies? Well. We, ha we have um, office hours every Wednesday within the private sector center. We have a office hours. I'm the technological reference there on Wednesdays. I'm there. Companies can come to us with or without appointment. They come, they have cle a clear vision. They have clear questions to ask us. And I'm there, we are there to support them. And we are available for them and we provide them with information, technical information. Sometimes it's about processing, sometimes it's because they need equipment. We can, for instance, tell them what type of equipment is available at the local, uh, at local level. We also give them uh, documents and we can also put them in touch with uh, reference in the sub-region that can help them if we can't help them directly. So we are there to listen to the companies, to understand whether what are the challenges that these companies are confronted with. So this is what we're trying to do. This, these office hours on the Wednesdays, we're there from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. We're there to listen to companies. They can come on appointment or not. We also have a secretary that can also put companies in touch with clients, for instance, or with the referent, the technical referent. And we help them also do a benchmark of technologies and we advise them on the choice of equipment that they can buy and also packaging that is best suited for the company. For instance, if they need information, technological information on processes or equipment for production or packaging, waste treatment or reuse of byproducts, etc., we can help them. We also explain them the national or international standards because most of the time in Mali, companies don't know the regulatory framework. So sometimes there are standards, they don't know how to use them, they don't know how to comply with these standards, how to, how to go about them. So we give them this information, we explain what are these standards and how they need to be able to process their products, how they can package their products, what are the different standards for each product, you understand? We also help them find the appropriate training we go on site, we go on site for companies, we visit companies, and when we see that, for instance, uh, there's staff within the company that needs specific training, training, we tell them which type of institute of training, institute training center that can help them, either via our partners or other training centers. We also connect them with specialized sales points. The sales points for that, because in Bamako, for instance, there are transfer, uh, They're specifically, uh, uh, specifically processing companies that can be very useful for these companies. We also help them find financing solutions. The hub does not, do, does not fund companies. However, we can guide them towards institutions or centers that can fund their activities. Passage, for instance, is one of the institutions that helps and supports young entrepreneurs, we can, for instance, guide them towards these funding bodies. 
the membership now. It's an annual membership. Why? Well, because it's a competitive group of entrepreneurs. We support them individually in the long term, but we also give them to an exclusive technological database. We have a platform and on this platform you have regional articles and national articles and this information is in the database and there, this information is available to companies. We also have the revolving fund which is there to help companies make the right choice when it comes to Packaging, this is a small fund, but it can still really go a long way for companies. And we also have a networking days. It's really interesting and really important because for that day, we have all the companies, member companies that can network. And we train a lot of these companies. And at the same time, they these different stakeholders, these different companies interact and some companies have a specific need and they can find a solution from another company. So this is very helpful, this exchange of knowledge. But they can also uh, benefit from support on CSR, Corporate Social and Environmental Responsibility. And they are also partake in a CSR award program. So we help companies understand what corporate social and environmental responsibility is about because these companies do what well, they generate a lot of waste. And this has a lot of, that's a huge impact on the environment. So we inform them on this responsibility, especially companies that use personal protection equipment. And this can be toxic for the employees, sometimes the, the, if they don't use this equipment properly, etc. So we train staff to the use of this equipment and we try to um, make them understand how their activities can have a positive impact on the environment. So a lot of companies have benefited from in-depth individual follow-up for their companies. I visit seven companies per month. So I visit them and I, com I accompany the production manager most of the time. I look at the way that they're working and I make sure that they comply with the standards and uh, at the workstation level, but also at storage level. And we help them test develop the development of new products. And we also look at their equipment. We advise them in their project of equipment. Usually companies have great ideas, but for the technological aspect of things, they're not necessarily as knowledgeable. So we can support them, especially when you do uh, quality controls, you need to be aware of the, all the different standards. And this is where we can help them. Uh, we can also help them with the startup of equipment and make sure that they buy the right equipment. We can support them, we can put them in touch with suppliers that are able to handle this type of equipment if we're not able to do it. And we can also help them in their specifications and safety and security measures because there are a lot of companies that start their activities at home. They start in their house, but when they have funds, they have their own sites, but we need to support them with the equipment, the stuff that they need, the skills that they need, what are the products, what are the quality uh, standards that they need to abide by. So we are there for companies. This is what we are here for as a reference as engineering technologists. I'm there to help them and to look at their method. So this is the program of Hub. So thank you. Thank you very much, Fanta. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, uh, we have completely run out of time, but I think it was important to, I felt it was important to uh, leave uh, every speaker uh, present fully what they prepared for us. And I thought it, it was very enriching and inter inspiring uh, 
listening from Alain about uh, what policy instruments and how to finance um, uh, urban city urban food systems uh, coming to um, to, the, to our entrepreneurs and to really learn uh, what is their experience from the ground um, and closing uh, with Ms. Fanta on uh, you know the institutions that support this innovation and the entrepreneurship in, uh, and agribusiness entrepreneurship around the cities and I really apologize that we have uh, we haven't saved space for a discussion I am probably not good time management person but uh, back to Paul. Uh, thank you very much again, all speakers. Um, you have been excellent and it was really uh, very interesting and enriching uh, your presentation and, and thank you for sharing your experiences. Paul to you. Thanks so much Barbara for guiding us through and I think um, while we didn't have time to discuss, this has been a really good show of deep technical uh, insights. Um, so uh, we've invited the panelists to share their contacts into the chat uh, if they feel comfortable um, and we do invite you to reach out and continue these conversations moving forward. To wrap up in a minute and a half, the Cape Town food dialogues are ongoing this week. Um, they are really interesting, really insightful online videos um, to which you can then add your own comment um, and this will then be summarized and returned to by the panelists um, in early August. Um, so they're trying quite a novel um, process uh, to uh, get some insight. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Ryan. So this has been our second last webinar. We've got a final webinar on Friday to reflect on African City Food Month and also contemplate what the future food systems entail. Um, we have, as I said, really exciting uh, speakers from Niamey in Niger, uh, Accra, um, the mayor is going to join us, um, as well as our colleagues at FAO, uh, our ICLE regional director is going to share uh, some of her insights um, on future food systems, um, as well as a few colleagues in research uh, and practice. Next slide, please. Right after this one, the reason we moved our webinar a bit earlier is because there is a global webinar to reflect on the analysis of the FAO Global Survey on the Municipal Response to COVID-19. That begins at two o'clock, um, and you'll see in the chat, uh, the link has been shared there, uh, a bit farther up. Next, please. And finally, uh, this webinar has also been part of uh, Rise Africa, which is a flagship program by ICLE, and the next Rise webinar is going to be on the 4th of August to look at localizing the SDGs um, in African cities uh, with lessons from South Africa. It's a, a two-part series, um, the first one on the 4th of August, and the next one will be on the 1st of September uh, to reflect on uh, insights from other African cities. Thanks again, really cool to see uh, familiar participants joining us. Uh, wish you well for the day and hope to see you uh, and colleagues on Friday. Stay well and uh, we'll see you soon.